What's up guys, it's DK. Welcome to Thorne's YouTube channel. Why are you even here though? Didn't you know Ginger Man bad? Perhaps in light of recent events, my new iconic slogan should, could become, Frankie my dear, I do give a damn. Because you know what? Actually, I do care about a lot of things in the esports industry, even if sometimes it's having to set people straight or correct them or maybe even correct the record, TM. Now, one thing that I don't need to correct the record in is my favorite energy supplement is, of course, Gamer Sops, isn't it? And this one here, Guacamole Gamer Fart 9000, is delicious. See this guy here being forced to eat an avocado and suffering because the dinosaurs making him eat it. Don't worry, that's all imaginary. Dinosaurs, cavemen, avocados, as far as I know, avocados are some sort of left-wing psyop to blame the youth for not being able to afford mortgages in an economy that's vastly different from the one that their past generations grew up in, isn't it? Anyway, enough about that. Obviously, you get 10% off with my code Thorin, T-H-O-R-I-N, at GameStops.gg. They've also got a whole bunch of newer flavors like Cherry Limesicle. They've got a couple that are coming out very soon. You can go and click on the website and find out for yourself. Remember, if you order some, be sure to put some of those free samples in so you get a little taste of some other ones along with your package. They are free. Now, if you've never seen Thorin versus Reddit before, I'm bringing it back, boys. I used to do this back in the day. I actually came from an idea of Monte Cristo, my friend in League of Legends, where I essentially just did a joke like, I should just read out Reddit posts and just tell them everything that's wrong in a video. And he was like, you actually should do that content. So I did for a few years. There's been more than 16 episodes. Like there's obviously been other ones that were specialists to certain other topics, but I'm going to bring it back as a regular one. I even along the way used to let people gaslight me. Like they just lie and say like, all he ever does is take the downvoted comment or the one that like, no one even cares about and everyone disagreed with. So then I started making all these rules. Like, no, no, it has to be like very upvoted has to be a problem. You know what? It could be whatever I want. Who are these random little demons, NPCs and bots to tell me what to do? I'm foreign. I am esports and I'll do whatever the fuck I want. So let's just hop right in and I'll just start cracking skulls in it. So on the first one here, there's a thread. You already know it's going to be great because the title of the thread is Richard Lewis was right. And if you know anything about the demons, NPCs and bots that make up the astro turfed shithole hellscape that is Reddit, you'd know that that's one thing that can never be allowed to stand. Like even if Richard Lewis actually cured cancer, saved the lives of every like infant that dies and also, like, brokered world peace, people would go like, yeah, but that doesn't take away what he's done on Twitter, though, and the things he said, and the unnecessarily aggressive tone in which that he's done. So basically, you know that's going to be it. But here's the thing. This isn't Thorin versus Richard Lewis haters. That video might come one day. So instead, what happens is a guy during the major made the point that, like, when once we knew only one of Faze, Navi, and G2 was making it to the playoffs, he says, it is a travesty. Really shows that T1, Tier 1, and the circuit in general is really weak right now, which is basically, obviously, what Richard Lewis was saying for months and months and months, ever since G2 won the Blast World Finals, and then I am Karavitsi. And by the way, he was totally right about G2. They hadn't pioneered anything or revolutionised the game. They're not actually even that amazing a team. They're just a very strong team of individual players and when they frag out they in theory can beat everyone in the game so then in comes an absolute genius of reddit this guy goes counterpoint if they are the best teams they should beat the not best teams Ooh. Ooh. let me think about that one hmm and then this guy down here goes, nah, you're definitely correct. I think the borderline closed circuit we have right now is softening the tier one teams. First and foremost, we'll adjust the second guy. Then we'll come back for his pal, right? Because they're both getting Jazzy Jeff the fuck out of this intellectual saloon. So the second guy, when he goes, you're definitely correct. I think the borderline closed circuit. What borderline closed circuit is that, by the way? You know, that's one of the craziest straw mans that I've seen created by actually even analysts and industry people, which is this notion that all tournaments and Counter-Strike are the last premier circuit where it's like you just have these teams and then you qualify one or two outside teams through an insane massive bracket and showdown all online just to get to the LAN and so basically unless you are like the top three four team in the world like Gambit and Heroic and Vitality and teams like that have been in the past when they've been able to get through that and qualify then it's just impossible and as a result these really good teams that could be secretly like seventh best if you think they're better than some of these teams top five top ten top fifteen top twenty it's just 
just actually them being locked out the circuit that we don't know secretly they are sick and they're actually better than Faze Narvi G2. Now the reason why that is so fucking insanely stupid is you haven't even engaged your brain to ask what the circuit is because Blast makes up how many lands in the year? Well let's count. They have the two finals to so spring and fall finals that you get through once you've gone through the whole circuit. They have the world final which in part you get to by um like doing well in the rest of the blast circuit also if you like win the major like outsiders did and it's not a blast tournament that can get you there as well that's how outsiders got to the blast world finals and then you have the two group stages which essentially it's just a split up like kind of it's and i eat cologne just have their group stage before the playoffs on the same week don't they so in this scenario or the week before it's just essentially two big lands and then a third big land. So three big lands is all Blast runs in the whole year. This time they ran a major as well, so they're going to be four this year, but that's not the Blast closed circuit. So it's really just three tournaments. Now, who else runs a lot of tournaments in Counter-Strike, guys? Let me just think. Oh, ESL, they run all the tier one tournaments aside from those ones, unless PGL or someone comes in and does a major. So let's just count the way, shall we? So let's just see. This year alone, you've got IM Kadavice, right? That's a tournament that has a plane. And if you're essentially just top 25 in the world, you get an invite, basically. You can go look up the way the system works. They have great seeding. Then you have, I mean, in this case, you had ESL Pro League, right? ESL Pro League is a closed circuit in the sense you have to qualify it to. But all the top teams, by the way, are in ESL Pro League, including loads of the teams that are lower down who actually routinely in competitions when they play against the no-namers that made it far in this major beat them so already that doesn't make sense and you can qualify into pro league anywhere by playing in the challenger league and other tournaments right then you have like i am dallas we're having right now again you can have a whole bunch of smaller teams get into that it's not a one with a plane then you go you're gonna have you had i am rio remember that one it's another smaller one but you have a bunch of options especially when people drop out for the teams come in and there's online qualifiers you can qualify through if you're some monty team is supposed to be Epic Online or Apex or whoever else. Later on, you're going to have IM Cologne, the classic one with a plane again. That's going to allow the top 25, top 30, or whoever can beat them in. That's why the IHCs of the world have made it into these tournaments before. The Movistar Riders, etc. You keep going through the year. This is ridiculous. It's the ESL Pro League again. It's absolute bollocks. Like It's just nonsense. These teams just weren't good enough. They weren't good enough to get to lands. Weren't good enough to get through. Quality. Notice how in a major, FaZe isn't allowed to lose a BO one against a team they shouldn't even be playing against. You just should win if you're the better team, even if you're both like third and fourth in the world. So why are you playing in the BO1? That's never coming into their brain. Death win if you're better. Well, then why don't you just win the online qualifiers then? Because actually, to get in the tournaments like Cologne and kind of eat it, they're enormous qualifiers, but anyone can do it in theory. And if you think that's legitimate, then what's the problem? Exactly. So make your case better. So I don't see how we've seen the softening of the tier one teams. What I think is some of these teams, Into the Breach is the best example, played a super fluky style that will not work, hasn't worked since, and quite frankly, wasn't working for them online before the major. But I tell you what, it worked with a couple of epic standout performances. The Cypher guy might be legit. The Crucial guy is not. I've seen his whole career. The Volt guy, jury's still out on him. So then let's go to the original one. Counterpoint, if they are the best teams, they should beat the not best teams. Right, so basically now... Pro Counter-Strike isn't an aggregate of how you do against the whole field and how you do throughout the year, tournament after tournament after tournament after tournament. What I love and what makes a very, very sturdy scene, like tennis, in which you can tell who's actually the best. No, no, what happens is it's like conquers. When FaZe wins like a Grand Slam and a major and four or five tournaments and lands and has a lot of top placings, when they lose to another team in any context, that means FaZe wasn't the best and they certainly, by this logic, aren't better than the team that beat them. So basically, Into the Breach, once they beat FaZe and Ents, is actually just flat out better than FaZe and Ents. They're not even that they're just better in that game or that game was on the right map or they had an interesting strategy or certain players overperformed or FaZe or Ents played probably. No, 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 no. The simple explanation that genius guy here has come up for us and he, by the way, upvoted to fuck up there. 403 points is the notion that actually FaZe just weren't the best and implication is they weren't even the better team. Actually, the better team wins every game, in which case, just go to a B01 format. We don't need any best of threes. Because the stupidest thing is, most people I know who are experts are complaining about the format, not that the team's lost, or they complain that the team played poorly. They never complain that the underdog did well and beat a top team in an actual real match. Like, who the fuck's complaining about that? Go find me that straw man argument. That doesn't exist, bro. It's just fucking nonsense. You can see if that was question one, we're in for a lot of fun here. So then we'll go to this one. 
This is a thread where it was about Carrigan telling his team this would be the greatest ever comeback. Or rather, he said that, like, on the mic or something. And obviously, they did do an insane comeback, and they did win the game. So if you go down here, this guy goes 27 points. I mean, why wouldn't you bet against FaZe? A FaZe that scraped into Legends on a 3-2 score, while Vitality and Heroic cruised through in four maps. Being ridiculously clutch, quote, is another way of saying constantly fucked up on their way into Legends and had to make up for it. Right, well, here's the problem. By that logic, you should never have ever bet on Team Liquid to make the playoffs. Because they started the tournament in terrible fashion back in the challenger portion. They even had to battle when they were actually in the next legend stage. They didn't even actually make it to the semis like they were meant to on paper once they got there. But they did though, didn't they? You know why? Because fundamentally, Team Liquid was actually a better team in terms of the individuals and what they were capable of producing on an aggregate day than most of the teams that didn't make it, like BNE or some of the teams that everyone loves out there. Like, by the way, Into the Breach made it the same amount of the way through the tournament. Was Into the Breach better than Team Liquid? On a couple of BO1s, yeah. I mean, this is just nonsense, mate. It doesn't even work that way. So then when he goes, why wouldn't you bet against them? Because we understand that Counter-Strike form changes from day to day and week to week and opponent to opponent and map to map. So what we do is we take an aggregate of how you performed over like the last three or four months. Then for players, we look at things like what's the flow of your overall ability? Like are you someone who bounces back? Like a device? Some of the great players who can go back to Zero, who can go back to the top again. People who are super consistent like Magus. You look at the factors of how the game went. You don't just go, well, they lost, so if they lost, then they're just worse than all the teams that won, and say balls or shit like this, like going, they scraped in a legend three to two, while Vitality and Heroic cruise through and four maps. Well, you know what, homie, then go and look at all those fucking Swiss system majors where we had the BO1s, where the three zero teams were joke teams, like Complexity at Face at London, and fucking, um, I think PGL Crackout was Big Clan. And these ones where these teams go 3-0, who aren't even close to the fucking best teams in the tournament. They're not elite squads. I mean, look at Monty in this one. And they go no further, and they just get bounced in the first round by any quality opponent that she face. And you know why that is? Because a fucking Swiss system doesn't actually tell you who's better. It just eliminates the teams who lose three times. That's it. That's why even seeding from the Swiss system is fucking bonkers. You don't even play the same opponents. It's so silly. But as usual, you don't need to put anything about how they played, the individuals, what composed them, what makes the dynamic of how you win or lose a Counter-Strike match. Not even the way you vetoed. No, no. You just go, there's nothing. And they lost more games, so they are worse. The teams that won more games, even if not against the same opponents and possibly even the opponents, they must be better. Therefore, since they are better, you should bet against the teams that are worse. What the fuck are you even talking about? And by the way, the reason why you don't bet against FaZe Clan is they're probably the greatest clutch fucking lineup to ever play a CSGO. Or they're at least top three, at a minimum top five, without me even expanding it out and looking at it. Then that whole thing of like being ridiculous, they just arm it. That's how they won all their championships. Every single one relied on being really clutch. They were never dominant ever. Even when they 2-0 teams in series, it was never stomps. And so as a result, like, oh, they're just being... it's not something that happened once, mate. It is actually an, an aspect of their character, of their DNA, made up by the personnel and the calling style. And when they get activated, because some of them seem to be super vets and can't always get going until their backs are against the wall. It's actually human psychology, by the way. There's been a lot of great, like, UFC fighters and stuff had a similar thing. I remember Kobe once said something like, until he gets sort of punched in the mouth. He doesn't always feel like he's getting going, as it were, when some guy like elbowed him. He sort of said like he sort of fired him up. He got him in that mindset. Now this whole thing where people just act like they're the greatest, like anyone who's good is just dominates some second one of the game. Think no, no. It, there's just a game, mate. And when the game's over, it doesn't matter if you won at the very end or you won from the very beginning of the game. Like I know, as people love that, like oh, it's a throw. It's like. How's it a throw, by the way, if you're really good at, st at quick starts, like heroic, 
and then you're just not very good at closing out a dot of the superstar players who can take over the game. But I'm actually a team full of veterans and a mixed roster of international players. And then what and also people who basically only have to win the championships anymore. They're not even about making quarters. That's not a big performance. And we tend to have slow starts, or sometimes it takes us the time to adapt to the opponent or individual forms of. But by the time you give us enough games, two maps, three maps, 30 rounds, 28 rounds, 25 rounds, we wake up. And then we start rocking and rolling. Isn't it actually harder to be really good at the end of games than the beginning of games? What are we even talking about at this point in time? And then the whole thing of like, that's another way of saying constantly fucked up in the Legends and had to make up for it. When you say make up for it, by your logic, when they fuck up, the other team's playing better. They then have to overcome that level from the opponent and still win the game. And that counts for nothing. This is dog shit analysis, mate. Am I, is this Professor from... HLTV secretly testing out some of his opinions for the major to say, you know, focus group in the most of my life. Man alive. What are you talking about? How about this one? Once we got the quarterfinals matchups, this guy goes, Vitality would have shat on face. The Frenchies on home soil and all that. But this is a safe draw for sure. I'll tell you how that safe draw went, homie. They played into the breach, probably the worst team to ever make the playoffs of a major. And I think they will never make another playoff of a major ever in any version of Counter-Strike with any of this core. And then basically, they actually struggled in the first halves of both maps. There was times when the Vital their Vitality team was still behind in the game and people were out fragging Z-Woo. Then you went to the semis and quite frankly, straight up, there's a world where Apex could have won this game. They were very much in it. There were some big, big players at times. And quite frankly, Vitality again looked shaky at points. And in the final, they almost lost the second map. Their home map, Nuke, that's been their stronghold they haven't lost on all this year and was going to be the map that did win them the championship. But in this case, they would have blown it right at the end in the easiest bracket ever and gone three maps with a Game of Legion team that the only good team they'd played and beaten was Heroic. That was it. And would have been only their second map they'd have won, uh, third rather, against a top, top team in this tournament. What the fuck are you talking about? So let's get into it. They would have shat on FaZe. Why is FaZe not allowed to ever improve, by the way? I actually think you could argue FaZe played better over the first two maps against Heroic than maybe even like Vitality did in games, like maybe against Apex or something like that. There was just times that looked mega shaky for Vitality. FaZe was having bad rounds, but then they were having some really good rounds and really big rounds and really clutch rounds. And as a team, they looked like as the tournament went on, they were getting a little bit stronger in each of the matches. And if you know how form works, the last thing you want to do if you're the other teams here, Monty, Game Legion, Liquid, you look over that FaZe where you're like, please, Heroic, take care of them. Because if FaZe somehow makes it to the semi, they're probably odds on to win then. And then to the final, they might be at peak strength. Like by that time, you know, we might be talking like it's almost a week, three, four days after when they might have played in the Swiss system last then we might be talking like a week and a half from when they were playing in the Challenger stage. That could be a totally different phase. That's almost like a different tournament at that point. So I remember some tournaments were like a week long or three or four days back in the back six, seven years ago. Now tournaments can last two weeks. It used to be three weeks from the major. So your form can change the day to day. You're only playing one match a day nowadays. So this just shows such a fundamental misunderstanding of basic concepts of Counter-Strike competition that you'd understand if you'd watched it for years. Oh, 98 points. That's because you guys are fucking peons. And the fact that you're upvoting and agreeing with these comments proves you are fucking peons. Although I will also say it's a mega astro turf to fuck forum that's full of bots and NPCs. So that is just the nature of it, isn't it? Now we had this where Kassad blaming Huxy for G2 loss where he has the gall to do this. I was watching it. Now all the fucking imbeciles in this thread, by the way, you go down here, they just talk about what a disgusting thing that he's saying. Like, what pathetic that he would say that. How dare you? By the way, even saying from a pro analyst, he's not even analysing this event. He's at home for fuck's sake. Huxy's in the tournament. And what you don't know is Huxy actually said the same thing to Kassad in a fucking match. He was like, I was watching. Are you watching, Kassad? So you know what? We have a saying in England, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If Huxy can do that, then Kassad certainly can, especially when Kassad's not even fucking working the event. He isn't, by the way. He's a contractor. When he's not working the event, he doesn't work for Blast. He is not obliged to, you know, be like under professional etiquette of how an analyst would be on his fucking Twitter account. You fucking cretin. Especially when actually Huxy did do it on stream as a professional player. He essentially denigrated the skill set of Kassad, the notion that he's wrong about his analysis. And so what did Kassad do? After Huxy and a, and a terrible veto that IGLs always have some saying, fucked it up completely for Nico and the others. 
Then he basically just said, like, yeah, I was watching it and did the same thing. Shot back over the bow with banter, it proportionate, and made the implication of, like, yeah, you're fucking up your own career and integrity and you're looking shit at your job. But as usual, they're fucking, oh, yeah, this is so professional. This is just wrong, mummy. Mummy, mean Cassad said things. Then the same people, by the way, when they're on their Twitter, yeah, it comes with the territory being famous. And you can't take criticism. Why you block me just because I said you most pathetic worm, piece of shit, arsehole, dog arsehole, fuck you, in your face, till you're dead, till you're dead with all your family in, a, in an empty grave. <laughs> what, you can't handle banter? That's fucking these guys, man. So let's have a look what they said in this comment, right? Mega upvoted comment. 738 points. Well, it's all G2 players' fault for not making into playoffs. So blaming only on Hooksy is kind of dumb, right? What's mental about that is his comment logically contains within it, even says it, the notion it also is Hooksy's fault. But the rest of the threads about how you're not allowed to call Hooksy out, it isn't his fault. This guy, you don't even know what you're agreeing with on this forum, you fucking imbeciles. Then there's the whole thing of like, well, it's all G2, but is it? What, every single time a team loses a game, it's all five players' fault? You do know one of the things that made simple, the GOAT, is that he barely won tournaments when we started calling him the GOAT in 2018. But he used to be so good, it was obvious that even when he was playing Prime Astralis, he was the best player in the server, even though he lost the game. And sometimes lost the game, like, in terms of team result, convincingly. Because we understand, actually, you don't apportion blame equally. It's not some communist nightmare. If what you actually do is you look how each person performed relative to expectations of what they were working with and how the opponent played. This is bonkers, this logic right here. I've seen Cold Zero be the MVP at tournaments he's lost the, in the finals of. He's just that fucking good a player back in the day in 2017. So this is just nonsense. Like what? It's every single player's fault. So it's JKS's fault. Do you even know how JKS played? No, no, because Nico like, did a bad fragging session on the last map, like it's his fault too. I mean, he was carrying the B&E game that they lost with one of the most epic performances you'll see at a major. But I guess it's his fault they lost that game too, right? It's just how a fucking child thinks. No, so there's never any analysis. It's just, you lost, therefore you're wrong. You won, therefore you did everything right. So by the logic of this guy, by the way, it's all the G2 players' faults. It's actually... All the credit to every single player of every lineup that won a game or made the major playoffs. Now, if you go and look, some of those players even had terrible stats. Sometimes you get carried. Sometimes you're just not fundamentally a good player. Sometimes you only work in this lineup. But no, apparently you're all just like better. But in fact, that even infers, by the way, that like, for example, Kixon from G2 is better than Nico because we're not even doing roles anymore. You know, um, your boy, let me think who will pick for this one. I mean, pick a bunch of the um, Gamer Legion people that aren't Shuey and aren't... I mean, let's in this by this analogy, uh, let me see, who can we go for here? Because I don't want it... I'll do it to the breach. Crucial is just fundamentally a better player than JKS. Because remember, we're not even going roll for roll. We're not even judging based on expectations of what they did. I mean, I agree with this guy. JKS did everything he could, mate. He played awesome. Even one of the games they lost, the one against fucking Vitality, we're all going to pretend like Zero didn't do one of the most ridiculous 1v4s. You'll see it at fucking Major with a perfect si silent fucking drop into the upper side of Nuke. Like, you guys don't, either don't watch the games or you don't have a brain to process them. You're just a fucking idiot. Then, Hooksy recently goes, whatever, dude. At I am Dallas, after G2 only wins 13 rounds over two maps and get 2-0 by Heroic, a better team. This guy... Carrigan has 0 0.86 rating past three months. Dexter has 0 0.9 rating past three months. Glaive Online, since they played a lot of CCTs, online tournaments, has 0 0.87 rating past three months. Yet no one considers them complete liabilities after every match. You know why? Well, first of all, we Glaive is just legacy. I think when you watch the games that he's had in Astralis ever since he lost Device, they're a fucking joke beyond maybe that little run at Cologne, the first one back. Then you go and you look 
at Dexter, I'd say some people do criticise him. He's just a well-liked player. He seems to have a cool personality. He's got that Aussie sort of swag, hasn't he? And he can frag a bit. Then you have Carrigan and people going on Carrigan all the time. Even when FaZe wins games, people say Carrigan should be kicked. The second they get eliminated, everyone says he should be kicked and he's it, replacing with Shuey, not ignoring all that Carrigan brings to the game. And do you know the real reason why people do get it wrong, though, when they're talking about this? Like you, not understand that Huxley can be a complete liability. It's because when we watch the game as experts who watch years and years and years of Counter-Strike, every big game, and especially we know the players, we talk to the IGLs behind the scenes, we ask their players, what do you think about what he's doing there? We ask him about rival IGLs, what do you think about the Vito? What do you think what they're doing there? I do all these interviews. I get all this straight fire content for you. All these talk shows. Get all this amazing info at them. One, because I know half of it anyway, you cretins. And two, you think I can't just do that but not turn the fucking camera on and press record? I can't just have that combo in private. It's like Richard Lewis says. He used to get info from God B and Sean Gares in 2016 when they were at the peak of their powers. And he'd go on stream and see it and balls all fans like this and go, what the fuck does Richard Lewis know? And it's totally wrong what he's saying. And that's not at all how those teams are thinking in the veto or what they're trying to do with their team because you just don't know what the fuck you're talking about you just huff the farts to the people you like and just deny everything intelligent the others say you're just telling on yourself for having no eye test mate do you know why we consider Huxley a liability but not Carrigan because even the way they play to get their frags is totally different the way Carrigan creates space is so ballsy and so intelligent and the way he gathers the information that passes it and especially with that type of an international team Huxley isn't doing that mate then you have a look at the Glaive one I mean look Glaive had times even when they were good occasionally where he'd have some bad tournaments but we could see the tactics we could see the way they were doing things in the mid round from his calls we could see the way his entrying used to actually cause massive problems for the opponent and put map pressure on sometimes so someone else could lurk somewhere else like Magus can get a kill on a guy rotating off a site or something like it's actually ridiculous notice none of these comments ever contain analysis they're all just number higher number lower I think higher good number lower bad you can't argue with numbers numbers are the truth Truth. You know what? Numbers don't tell you anything. They're not alive. They can't speak. You are the one who has to interpret the... Essentially, you tell yourself what you think the number means. A number doesn't mean anything. You're drawing the pattern. You're applying your paradigm of thought. You're processing what's going on. Device is averaging 30 kills per map at IM Dallas. What the actual fuck? Then it descends in with de debate about, well, he was like a goal candidate. He was only one nature simple because of his amazing record stuff. As usual, there has to be Zewu stands come in and just talk out of their complete arse because they just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And they're in love with a French boy. And this scores 22 points. Zewu is about to win his third number one player in just five years. And you put Device as the only candidate versus Simple. Ooh. You know why that is? I personally think, I mean, Zebu hasn't had enough years yet, but in terms of his peak years, a bunch of them are probably better than Device, but my the reason I have to say probably is because I test checks out, but in terms of actual like deep runs in prestige tournaments, they don't check out at all. He's barely ever done it. He only just made it past his first quarterfinals of a major, this major against shitters. Never beaten a team ranked in the top 18 of HLTV's world ranking in a best of X series at a major in the playoffs. Never happened ever in his career. And he's played something like five or six majors now. Then you go ahead and you add in, might even be, might even be seven majors now. Because let me think, we've had four majors after the online era and he had two before. So it should be six. Then also we got the whole thing of like, device, if you count accomplishments, I don't think they're that huge. Wipes the fucking floor with Zewu. Zewu's not even... Zewu's not in the same category as Simple for results. And by the way, Device has a way better resume than Simple even. He has the goated fucking resume. Then let's add in, when you add in a bunch of the things about Zewu, you have to exaggerate them to make them so sick. So when you say it like that, he's about to win his third number one in just five years. Right, first of all, just five years is irrelevant. Like, you're implying, like, so he'll do X, Y, and Z. You don't know what he'll do. You don't know what he'll do. You can I never say that, and that's not the way that games work. It's so, so rare you have Messi and Ronaldo's type guys who every year can be the best. We'll see if Zewu can even continue that. It's impossible what Simple's done. It's insane the consistency Device has had, quite frankly, and the ability to bounce back. Then when you say his third number one, you make it sound like all number ones are equal. Are they? Like, was number one when Simple was number one in his best year? Was another number one on previous years as good? I'd say there's times when Simple and Zewu were number two, when they were better than some of the number ones of past years. Then also, when you say his third, no, no, by HLTV. 
I mean, I disagree with that. I don't even think he was the best player in 2021. I had that as simple. Um, no, no, sorry, in 2020, I had that as simple. I had 2019 as even, but I had 2020 as simple. Then let's add in, who gives a fuck about 2020? It was all online. And 2021 was partially online. 2020, you can just eliminate. When we talk about the GOAT, no one's talking about online play. Nobody gives a fucking monkeys, mate. They're only talking about land play. So first of all, Zebu has one and a half years of his, that five years of his career online. So delete that immediately. Take whatever it is, six, seven, eight of his, I think six at least of his MVPs away from him. They don't count. Take Zebu's and devices away. Well, yeah, they've got a bunch they can take away, but then we'll see the real ones. Because as a result, Zebu's like leapfrog past people like Cold Zero, get right, in a way where, and Kenny S, when he just hasn't. He just hasn't if you watch the tournaments. Just nonsense. Then also, that's just a barren resume, doesn't he? I don't have as big a problem with that. But then again, you all fight against me and say, I don't know nothing about the game. So you're shooting yourself in the foot there. Just like with Nico. Nico haters. Nico fans rather hating on me. Don't know I was one of the best people to defend him on the legit stuff, you cretins. Because I actually think logically and I have a consistent set of principles I apply over the years. And then he puts a new put device as the only candidate. <sighs> You're going in five years, number one. Like, Device, wasn't he like a top five player for like fucking six or seven years? You could argue that's harder. You actually could. When FaZe in the IEM Dallas upper bracket lost to Ents, every time FaZe loses, by the way, it's the end of the world. They never knew win, win another series. People said that before they won the Grand Slam. People said that before they won Cologne because they lost Blast and IEM Dallas. People said that after... Um, they came back and didn't do well in Pro League. They were done then. But you know what? Then they had the run to the four finals that they were like a round from winning. Then in the, in the Blast World Finals, weren't they like top four or something? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They get written off every single time. And then what happens is when you write like one out of two or three occasions, you let's see, see. Then you go and you look. As usual, mega upvoted. Has to be abuse of Carrigan. 500 IQ Carrigan saving strats for. Ah, fuck it. I'm tired of this meme. FaZe is not even a top 10 team. You know, on, on hot, point, hot Take Point made, Kassad had struggled when he made the point they're not a top five team to actually, like, establish what their problems were. And they're just not even top 10. Spoiler, unless you can name then your top 10, what you say is pretty much worthless. I'd love to see who's at the bottom of that top 10, by the way. Because there's going to be people like Fury and Fnatic, you know, who don't even go in general over the years as far as FaZe does, you fucking morons. Then you go here, I really don't care about their comebacks. Right, so comebacks don't count anymore, guys. It's only now the person who's winning for the first half or two-thirds of the game that gets to win the game. Fuck knows why. He just gets to make it up as he goes. If you only rely on that, then you're fucking dumb as they come. They're not relying on it, you moron. They're having a harder time starting. By the way, the start of the game is when all the work of the opposing IGL and coach have the most effect. As the game goes on and you adapt to them and figure them out their te player tendencies and where there's little holes and smokes and gaps in their tactics that you can rotate through, and as their playbook gets diminished and depleted as the game goes on, that's where actually, in theory, the better team takes over. You know, by these logics, right, you can go back in time and there'd be a whole bunch of games that people like Fnatic 2015, classic NIP, especially from like 2014 onwards with that core. You, I mean, there's no, my, all, the, all the magic shouldn't count. None of those titles should count. If you go and even look at some Astralis games, this time towards the end of 2018, they had to do crazy comebacks to win games. But they did because that's how good they are. So again, you're just making up a million rules as you go on. Holy hell, this team becomes so shit in no time. Wait a minute, in no time. No time? But they've been doing these comebacks for years. In no time. Despite the names playing on it. I'll notice you don't actually flame those names. What you do is you just flame Carrigan. Apparently, he's saving strats and not doing real strats. Like, do you want to just point out that Twists has had so many fucking shocking games as a follow-up T-side rifle over the last few months. Shall I bother pointing out that Rain had a nightmare in some of the games at the Major? Or that fucking Rops wins the best clutches ever, but also mega baits sometimes. It doesn't even attempt the backstab for Mac pressure. He's almost on the happy get-right level of when they were at the end of their career. He's just still fabulous mechanically and still able to win the most impossible clutches when you need to. But I guess they don't count either, even though he routinely does it. They should be ashamed of themselves and apologise to their fans for their tier 3 performances. Nah, go and ask for a refund, dickhead. They owe you nothing. You would, by your logic, you would have never, but you're even implying you're not one of their fans, but they have to apologise to their, shut the fuck up. Who are you to tell them what they have to do with their fans? 
Not to take anything away from Mets, you're just talking all the way. You just said that Bozo 500 IQ Carrigan saving strats, that they're fundamentally a bad team and that the, 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 the names in it don't play like it. Therefore, Ence's win is mega diminished. It's not even that good, is it? Shit. All they do is rely on comebacks in phase and they couldn't get the comebacks. So basically, easy win for Ence. Ence isn't even that good a team by that logic. You fucking moron. But FaZe didn't really show up, so it was easy for Ence. You just took away from Ence there. You just took away. What I'd love to do for Ence is go, mate, I've seen FaZe hang around in games and do those comebacks, and they can get dangerous, but you managed to neutralise them. You managed to close the game. You managed to step on their throat and crush the windpipe rather than let them battle back up and start breathing again. No, 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 no. Nah, you're just too smart, right? Ah. <sighs> This was a brilliant one. 911 upvotes. This was during the major. Why are people so upset by underdog stories all of a sudden? This means you just came out of a dick five minutes ago. You not only don't know anything about the history of the game or the discussions that on every big major, but you also don't even know the arguments of the most articulate, verbose people in the scene who are constantly explaining their arguments in content, videos, talk shows, on Twitter, ad nauseum. We have had these conversations nine million fucking times. These would come in the FAQ of how to be a CSGO fan. But you're so fucking new or stupid or ignorant, you just refuse to or cannot learn what's going on. And instead of going, I'm new here, don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Can I get some insight? You go, why is everyone so upset? And then straw man the fuck out of everything. He goes, seeing discussion about the playoffs online, it seems people want to see the same teams every time. No, no, people want to see the best teams to make for the best games because the best teams play the best in the best games later in the tournament and provide the best possible matches and also that is literally what keeps Counter-Strike going sort of as in it still doesn't even make enough money to justify the mega salaries but having good revenue coming from things like massive exposure coming from big viewership helps the TOs helps the teams helps the players so the whole industry essentially relies on that by the way where is the excitement of seeing new teams pop up Back in the day, Luminosity appeared and everyone was hyped. Same with the current Cloud9 roster, right? One, Luminosity, with your eye test, none of these people apply it. You could see was actually playing innovative Counter-Strike, even when they had lesser players like ZQKS and fucking Steel and Bolts, etc., Fallen had his guys. He wasn't even fragging well himself, and he wasn't even the author sometimes. On T side, if they got man advantage 5v4, they were so good at playing well around it and winning that. That's why when he got them the, the sort of super team or the better players at the end of the year and going into 2016, they became one of the best teams in the world. They already had the style. They just had to have better players to implement it with. He didn't have Cold Zero initially. Then he didn't have FNX and Taco. And he didn't have Zeus as the coach, did he? And by the way, even when he had Fallen, Fur and Cold Zero, three player, two players you could already tell were really good. Fur was always good from the beginning. Cold Zero was really good in his debut. People were hyped because Cold Zero was in the team and emerged as one of the best players in the world. Who the fuck in Into the Breach and Apex is one of the best players in the world? Nobody. The Gamer Legion guy, Emma, might be, and this is one really big line that he's shown it at so far. And even then collapsed in the last map, the last half of the final. This is ridiculous. And say like everyone hating them that they are taking deserved spots. No, it's that we knew what would happen is what happened. That like Monty breathes to everyone. Notice you don't mention them. They were absolute shit in the playoffs. Ruined one of the quarterfinals. Then you have someone like um, Gamer Legion. Never could have actually won that final against Vitality. They almost had their best possible chance. Still wasn't really that close. It was just closer than it, the scoreline suggests. And if you were a better team, you actually might have been able to win that match. But someone like Heroic would have almost certainly given Vitality a better match. I can bet on it because I've seen the, all these teams play big tournaments. I think even FaZe would have. Team Liquid, it's debatable, might have on the right maps, etc. Let's just ignore all that, right? More on saying about paid spots. I personally enjoy seeing these new teams appear and do well. More competition is healthy and drives teams to innovate. Every time you beat someone, by the way, you have innovated and you have elevated your level of play and it can never be a fluke. Not only can it never be a fluke that the best teams who routinely show us how good they are can underperform in a map, a game, a series, a day, a tournament, but every team that has a one-off map, series, day, turn, they're just automatically better above already and they've leveled up Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike's like a book and FaZe was up to chapter 11 and then Into the Breach had read up to chapter 12 and they just beat them using the new way of Counter-Strike. Did you watch that game? What are they doing on T-Side that was so genius? It's fucking nonsense. They were just straight rushing, sometimes dry rushing into sites on vertical Inferno T side and just entry fragging people. That isn't innovation, you idiots. 
That actually doesn't even work on a long time span, as they showed later in the tournaments when they got really big pressure matches. They got nervous and started just walking into the sights on Anubis. And all of a sudden, the game just went away from them and gradually went to Vitality. And Vitality just inevitably won the match, didn't they? And then the, let's just ask this. Why are people so upset? They're not. They're upset when the format is shit and the teams lose because of stuff like FaZe and G2 played other really strong teams. That sucks. If there was good seeding and every match was best of three, there would be very few complaints and it would make these upsets way more legit. And then they even, if they won three best of three, maybe they even start and are sure they maybe are better teams. And maybe the circuit, but we didn't get that. But, because, but you'll never engage with any of the interesting discussion points because you're a cretin on Reddit. Astralis talent here versus Endpoint. Losing to Endpoint. Academy team of Astralis in the CCT online. And who plays for Astralis talent? Zipnix, one of the highest paid contracts in the world and in the history of Counter-Strike. This guy down here, you can never do anything wrong if you're a beloved player, by the way. Hi there, kind. Poor Zip. I can't imagine 43 points. How much it affects your mental to be playing at top tier level most of your career and now at junior level. I hope he does well and can get back into tier 1 CS. Here's the problem with the Zipnix one. I feel bad when great players like Kenny S or Guardian struggle or Liege now. But that's depending on their circumstances. Like I don't feel that sorry for Kenny because he sort of gave up. He didn't put in the hours. I don't feel that sorry for Guardian because he never should have accepted that Poison Chalice move back to Na'Vi. He clearly wasn't ready for it. He should have gone to a smaller team. I feel very sorry for Leach because he's put his heart and soul in the team for years and his game's gone off the boil even though I'm almost certain he still practices enough. Now, in terms of Zipniks, when did he fall off? Oh, that's right. Right after he secured Le Mega Bag. After I even told people, he was trying to get an even crazier bag from Cloud9. He was trying to get that fucking money, more money, than old price tag. Essa tag ended up getting... He just only cared about money at that point in his career. And that's why he never came back that good from the break, from these moves, from getting the mega bag. So you feel sorry for him because for a solid, what we're talking about now, maybe two years, year and a half, he just tanked his fucking game because he was already paid and looked nothing like the great player he once was. He even looked shit in a lot of those games. And in doing so, he dragged down Config and Blame F and made people like Lockie and Farley just get fired over and over because they were the ones who had to be the scapegoats because you couldn't get rid of this guy with this enormous contract you can't get rid of. He allowed Glaive to just get excuses for you. It's fucking outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. It's a shock that when they caught him, they're doing way better now. And suddenly they can compete with some top teams, even though the players they haven't replaced him with aren't even necessarily that good or we don't know how good they are really yet. But no, no, it's all about Zipnix and how he feels. I mean, he's only a millionaire many times over once he finishes this contract. But yeah, let's just worry about how his mental state is. Because he obviously deserves better, right? For whatever reason. Evil Geniuses, the real Evil Geniuses, lost 9-16 to to an unranked NA Advanced team in an ESEA Capus Cup during the major that they didn't qualify for and initially didn't even qualify for the RMR. Then this guy, no points, fair enough. Decides to defend the idea that EG didn't manage their team wrong in terms of GM, even though it's been made public. They could have had Kassad. They could have had a whole bunch of people would have taken over the team, given the right powers. Someone like Zeus would never have left if he'd have done things right. That's the reason why I published my video, show much shit show they are. And then on top of that, you go, come on, who are these players they could have chosen? For one, moving to another country isn't a sure thing that all players can handle. Refresh probably or presumably already has a visa isn't a brand risk and has proven that he can play at a decent level. Why does he already have a visa, by the way? Please say it's not because he played in a team years and years ago over a different region. Please say that isn't what you actually think, how you think the visa works. Then already, this whole angle of like, who could they have gotten? It's already been published, mate. You've been on this Reddit for years. Kassad said that they could have had Jacob. He wanted him. That's one of the players he was going to bring on. You know that guy who just made it to semi-finals of the major? Then how about, I've made it clear that Valde would have joined. In fact, that's why he didn't join Astralis. Valde ended up having a joint end to the end. He was going to join. He was up for it totally. And by the way, he doesn't have to be your star player. In fact, I'd say in NA, they only have like fraggers and aimers. They need the other pieces. They need the Crimses, the Roys, the fucking... Back in the day, the Zipniks and MBKs. In the modern day, Valdez. They need that sort of player, like an anchor. It could maybe even be the IGL. I've heard he might switch to that. This is ridiculous. There's two players right now that are already better. 
Then there's a whole bunch more players that I know would go because here's the thing. They know Evil Geniuses has money. There's people who are playing right now who are way better than all EG players, playing for 10k, 15k, 12k, 18k. If you give them the 20, 25k that EG can pay, then yeah, they're going. I'm telling you right now, I know that. You're just a guy on Reddit speculating. I know that. I could tell you more names, I just choose not to. Why the fuck should I, quite frankly? Talking Counter, they had an episode with me. And basically, this guy talks about the idea that you can both have the scene sort of degrading from the blast partner system or the closed partner system, but also that like upsets, etc., are good and prove that these teams are good. And then he says this thing, that it implies they're sort of not bad for the tournament because he goes, the thing that is also clearly being missed, spoiler, random shithead nobody, I'm going to guess he's missed the clear things and doesn't, isn't just suddenly the guy walking around, you know, I've never looked into this, but I'm just a smart person in this whole room of people studying this for their whole life. He goes, the thing that is also clearly being missed here is that new teams and or individuals who overperform start getting followers. Is that true? I'll give you a little assignment right now. I even bigged these people up on Twitter and said, go and follow Cypher if you want to be next on the train. Go and follow Emma. Go have a look at how many Twitter followers they have now. Emma was in the finals of a major. Cypher was in the quarterfinals of a major. They beat some of the best teams in the world. Where's all the followers? Still fuck all compared to people from years ago. Donkeys years ago. People from 2014, mate. Start getting followers, which changes who the favourite players are. It doesn't. You're talking about a tiny niche of people who read Reddit. That's already a tiny, 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 tiny amount of people who even follow CSGO Esports. And then this is just the nutters that post on Reddit and then think that they have the whole opinion of the community, which a lot of analysts get caught in that too. I don't. I know you are nobody. You aren't even representative of the people who follow the game. When I get 20,000 views on my video, when I go to live events, I have hundreds of people queuing up. Say, Thorin, can we get a picture? Magically, it's not those four arseholes that are the same names I RES tagged years ago who just say the stupid shit on Reddit or just the same people banging on about my Twitter all the time. The ones who dine out on the story of being blocked from five years ago like it was the biggest moment of their life. Oh, wait. Checks notes. It was, wasn't it? So when you talk about that, that's not even true. Do you know, right now, to this day, Emma will be barely known by people in Counter-Strike. There are so many people play Counter-Strike. Meanwhile, Scream hasn't even been in Counter-Strike for years. It'll still be way popular. So many more fans. Way bigger socials. Night and day. People like Pasha, Get Right, Neo, Forest, All these legendary players, mate. They have way more following. As usual, you take your little worldview and just project it on the whole world and think everyone's like you. By the way, what does that say psychologically about you that you need the whole world to think the way that you think? So I just think it's complete nonsense. Like, go look at IM and Gamer Legion in general, Boros, etc. People still barely know. The no one even mentioned Boros except people like me because he didn't make it past quarters for fuck's sake. Nobody gives a shit. Even the one where he fragged out against Na'Vi, people just gave credit to the War of 2K guy because that shit trash talk he tried years ago. It's fucking absolute bollocks, mate. Same thread. Oh, no, sorry, different one. The one with twists. This is mental. Top comment, 77. Sponge takes Joe Rogan pills. Ha <laughs> ha, crying, laughing. <laughs> I can't take anything he says seriously after this. So, right. Because Sponge takes Joe Rogan pills, not even Alpha, Alpha Brain, that's what it's called. Anyone who's watched the show for years and years know they're called Alpha Brain. I suspect already, by the way, you don't even know the name, you call them Joe Rogan pills. Literally, your company he invested in, but not his company. I, I can already tell that you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And then you go crying, laughing, because he takes those pills. I can't take anything he says seriously. Right, because he takes those pills, you're implying that don't work on just nonsense or a ripoff or a scam, right? That it means every single thing Chad says is a brain for CS, his long experience, the connections he has with players, like different things he's seen in the game, different philosophy. They're all nonsense. They can't be taken seriously because he takes some pills that you don't even know the name of or what they contain, apparently, or what they do. And that's just silly to you. Therefore, everything he says is nothing. Why the fuck are people up voting this shit? You're as stupid as this fucking guy. And this guy, by the way, goes, a lot of CS talent are quite special outside their... By the way, he's implying they're retarded. On everything except CS, they're retarded, which, by the way, already goes against what that guy said. Because basically, that guy was saying that everything they say, including their CS stuff, can't be taken seriously. Now, what's mad is, when you go down here, this guy goes on about what Alpha Brain is, etc. He takes this stuff. 
You know what's hilarious? If you keep scrolling down, a guy even explains it. It's just sort of like a very simple nootropic. Like, if you look up a lot of the nootropics people use to, like, enhance brain function, it just takes a bunch of the popular ones there, rebrands it and sells it in one pill so you don't have to explore it, which is exactly what Alpha Brain does. Now, look, you might not want the cognitive effects it has, but can you deny it has them? Do you even know what you're talking about? I bet you think all supplements and nootropics and even, like, things like taking magnesium, they're just a scam, aren't they? Because otherwise, why wouldn't the massive technocratic system that keeps me under its boot and wants me sort of like a bit sick as well, why wouldn't they just tell me to take it? You're just a cretin who has to be spoon-fed everything. And even worse, because you're being spoon-fed, you don't even want to eat the... They have to go, here comes the plate now. This is... This is vegetable peas, not I, I want applesauce, mummy. You're just a fucking idiot. You know, no, this is good for you, love. Come on, eat up. You can have the applesauce next. You're just morons. You're just morons. You don't even know what the pills are, but that's enough to denigrate. Like a, a, one of the best analysts ever in CSGO and all his opinions on CSGO. Spinks. Snappy called him a stats player. Spinks played with Snappy, and Snappy knows his style as sort of a very baity lurk player, and that he's allowed the full freedom to get all the kills when he was an ends, and they've given him some of those roles again in Vitality. So as banter, he called him a stats player to sort of get in under his skin during a match. The eSports grudge match always delivers. I really want the opportunity to see Nork against Nip or SDY against Na'Vi. Right, here's the problem. This isn't actually an esports grudge match. Like, if anything, the grudge is only on one side. The grudge match is where there's like two sides to the grudge. What would the grudge be from Spinks? Presumably that Snappy called him a stats player, but he even sort of knows that's true. Also, Snappy's not mad Spinks left. He knows it was a good deal for him so that he had to go. Yeah, he might have wanted to keep Spinks, so maybe there's a slight grudge there. Like, you should have stayed with us, but why would you? By the way, Snappy would take the right offer if he went to a way bigger team with better players too. I think if he got the G2 offer, he'd take it tomorrow if I had to guess. He's actually a person I know. Then when you say, I want the grudge match, you pick like the shittest grudge matches ever, like Nork against Nip. Why would he have a grudge against them? Like if he wins, does he prove like, ah, see, I proved that you shouldn't have taken device up. Oh, wait, you haven't got device anymore. That's irrelevant. So, I mean, I guess actually by every possible metric, you should have taken device up. So why have I got a grudge? Then SDY against Na'Vi. SDY was never good enough for Na'Vi. He joined, they immediately won Blast with him just having bang average stats. And everyone's logic was, because Na'Vi without SDY had been so good previously in 2022 and especially the last year in 2021, everyone's like, you know what? If he just doesn't prove to be a liability, keep him just because the rest of the team's really good. Nobody was ever like, he's really good. And as, by the way, he actually showed he wasn't particularly good as the team fell down and he wasn't one of the people propping him up. So why would SDY have a grudge against Na'Vi who actually gave him a massive boost and a chance and a bunch of salary? And why would Na'Vi have a grudge against him? He wasn't that good. They should have replaced him. Everyone went Monty Woody went, ah, oh, see? You should have kept SD White. It's like when Acor beat fucking Mouse. Like, aha, you replaced Acor. Yeah, we told you, a guy that we've all said is way better for the last year and a half and looked a lot more promising. Meanwhile, Acor was a bomb on Mouse in 2021. He's looking really fucking bad. He's only had a couple of good tournaments this year or into the last year. It's so overrated. It's so, these aren't even proper grudge matches, mate. What's the GOAT mismanaged org in CSGO? Strong contenders? OG? Not even vaguely. Nexagon? I've heard the players wanted him out for fuck's sake. Dexter on break? I mean, he's a fragged out of his mind at two majors in a row. And it's just sort of a down period where they're not in the big tournaments. Who the hell knows what their roster's meant to be? They've actually done a pretty decent job, bearing in mind their budget of recruiting players. It's just when they had Lexi B, they didn't put the right players around him. Astralis? Yeah, I'm with you, that one. I'm on that one. G2, about to get another IGL after disappointing results again. Why is that mismanaged, though? Why is that mismanaged? Like, was it wrong to get Ekstaz? We all thought he was like the coach of the year when he's in Vitality in 2020. Was it wrong to get Lexi B? He looked mega when he was in OG. This even looks pretty decent in Nip now. Was it wrong to get Monacy? I mean, the joke is actually Monacy was the worst signing they ever made relative to the amount they paid. They just locked out and so far it's worked out. <laughs> By the way, if he ever goes to shit, it'll be a nightmare what you paid for that. Then this guy, there's always a bozo, up for it, goes, well, I mean, the C9 with Henry G thing was a pretty monumental failure. I can never remember which one was the Colossus and which one was the Juggernaut between them and Cole. <laughs> Sounds like you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, mate. It was obviously the Juggernaut was fucking complexity and obviously the Colossus was Cloud9, weren't they? Like, again, you obviously didn't follow the story. It goes solely based on how much money they publicly invested into a team that didn't even look like a tier two team on paper. Oh, my goodness. I thought he was at least going to say because of the results. On paper, that didn't even look like tier two. 
When they made that team, we all thought Lance could come back in a couple of months. You had Woxic. On Lan was a very good player until we went online, but he's a player who notoriously didn't give a fuck about lesser matches, even in Lan sometimes. Then you had... Um, who else? You had Alex, who'd come off being one of the best IGLs in the world before we went online with Vitality, beating out Na'Vi and people like that. Then you had... Um, Esetag, just a journeyman player who could always fill the roles. If you're just asking him to be a support, he can even do that job. Yeah, overpaid, but it's because it was between him and Zipnix and Astralis managed to finagle you. Then who else did you have? You had Floppy, who people thought and until about six months ago was still saying was one of the best NA players and you should be in Liquid and all that. Magically, whenever you get in these teams, they just flame you. But when you're not in, you, you have to be in, otherwise you're a moron for not signing that guy. Oh, and then the fifth player, by the way, was Mezzi, who turned out to be one of the best scouted players from a Tier 1 team, probably in the last three or four years of Counter-Strike. Looks great on Fnatic, even as an IGL, frags out. Looked good even in this team, who was one of the better players. And the coach was Kassad, one of the best, like, low to medium Tier 1 coaches we've ever had in Counter-Strike. Fantastic resume of overperforming with his teams. Right? They didn't even look like a Tier 2 team on paper. On paper, you're out of your fucking mind. They looked like at least like the 10th best lineup in the world on paper. And then you look how they played. Their problem is they couldn't close games out. And it was all online. They had almost every series would be super close. They were going close with the best teams in the world. Go look at the top 10. Go look at their performances. There were so many times they were three maps or 16-14 or overtime. I've never seen a team win that few matches that was that close consistently and performing in epic fashion. Because it failed, you, a bozo, can just look back and go, it never even looked good to begin with. Brilliant. After Into the Breach beats NIP in an online game in the upper bracket quarterfinals of fucking CCT, a.k.a. who gives a shit. In close fashion, safe to say, 142 points, Into the Breach is either tier 1.5 or tier 1, in my opinion. No reasons why. Just because they won an online match. Well, remember, that means that their major run was totally legitimate. Because if you go back and look at CCT and other online tournaments before the major, they were crap. They weren't even vaguely a top, top team. They weren't a team that was even fragging out that much. They had some of the worst stats at the RMR. But they're just clearly tier one. Either tier 1.5 or tier one. Are they? I don't even know that they're clearly top 20. I want to see them on another land, quite frankly. But as usual, you win, you're better. You lose, you're worse. Here's a good one. Fun fact, the worst performance in all of Tier 1 CSGO is ironically held by the best American rifler of all time. First of all, there's no irony because this comes during a time period when he was having his worst ever year of his career once he'd reached the actual top star status, right? Well, you actually, you'd assume that when superstar players will really hang on the longest because of who they were, play longer and go into their bad years that they could have not only some of their worst games, but especially if they were used to a lot of resources and they don't get as much now, which I don't think he does, then you're going to actually have some of the worst games. Well, yeah, of course. A bum can just stop like playing and play like a coward. Someone like Lee's trying to turn his career around. He's going to keep battling, isn't he? Then there's the whole thing of like, fun fact. Fact. That means there'll be no opinion there. The worst map performance in all of Tier 1 CSGO. No, no, no. You mean the worst rated or worst statistical map performance by these metrics. That would be a fact. You've just given an opinion there. The worst map performance isn't even based on stats. You'd have to look with the eye test and see how good or how bad they are. By the way, a spoiler, Vu, who even though he memes a lot, can be a very legit analyst in his own right and does, he knows a lot about CS. He did a video where he analysed this game and he showed how many rounds Elijah was mega unlucky on. And it wasn't even close to one of the worst performances you've ever seen from a rifler. Never mind even probably fucking an NA player. It's just absolute bollocks. As usual, there's no analysis on Reddit. It's just morons. It really is just HLTV, but they just have like a different system of upvotes and downvotes so they can organise the morons into a neural network of cretins and they just put longer comments without the fake flags. Forrest stood in for Crims at IEM Dallas. I love this because it again shows how the people who give their like bold opinions on Reddit don't even know what the fuck they're talking about. Not in basic facts and they don't even just go and look on Wikipedia. So when he joins in instead of, there he goes... 30 points to this. He goes, they say Fnatic legend, but I was under the impression Forrest had only ever played for Nip and Dignitas. There wasn't even Nip at the end of CS fucking 1.6 for something mad like 
four or five years. What are you fucking talking about? You didn't know Forrest played in Fnatic. These are the motherfuckers telling me how great Forrest is. I was the go to Counter Strike. Didn't even see him play ever for Fnatic. By the way, he was in Fnatic for like five years straight. He won majors with them. That was actually the peak of his entire career was in Fnatic. He was better in that team than any other team since ever. You don't know Forrest then. And they're not a Fnatic legend. <laughs> it's the reason why they went from nobodies in Counter-Strike to one of the greatest orgs ever in Counter-Strike. Way before CSGO, motherfucker. And in fact, people like Khan from that team even informed what they did in CSGO and still do to this day. <laughs> and also, by the way, if you go elsewhere, I saw there was a bunch of other people like, ah, oh, I actually, you know, Wanted to see... Something mad, like, I wanted to see him play with Crimson for nights. Like, you even stood in last year, for fuck's sake. Do you even follow this game? If you don't, why do you have opinions? The fuck? Like, look, I know why you do. I'm essentially asking rhetorically, why do you have to put them on the internet? Do do it, by the way. This is the stupid barbershop or moron in the bar go, pub going, hey, I wouldn't go out like him, fucking pussy, he'll break my arm. Hey, fucking, hey, come on, Bora, come on, Bora. You are that guy. It's okay. That is the appropriate place for you. I'm just saying, I think you're a fucking moron. Device on overpass is something else, man. What a beast. Now, what's great about this is look at some of these performances. The pluses are insane. The rating's insane. Look how many games he's over 20 frags. And he's primarily using the AWP. Now, here's what I love. They can never go without overrating fa Fallen in every context on Reddit. He goes, he took the throne from Fallen on that map and never gave it up. Right. You know how you think Fallen was the god of that map? He wasn't. That was one of his best maps. But go look in Fallen's Prime, 2016, 2017. Just go look on that map. And look how many times, like... Basically, the majority or half the time, Fallen can't even get 20 frags on that map, even when they win, and win handedly even. He's just not doing it. That was the map where Fur was the god, you idiot. That was the map where Cold Zero's a monster on either side. Ugh, there's so much to that map. He was a great IGL on that map in 2016 and 2017. What an overrated even AWPer. This is the reason why I never really called him the best AWPer either, quite frankly, except maybe like one brief period in time, maybe in 2016. Even then, I'm not sure it'd have to be when like... Maybe have to be when Kenny was in a little bit of a funk and Guardian wasn't as much on his game as Canoodle already fallen off. And then this whole thing that he took the throne from Fall. Right, what I love is they do that because Device, like a lot of players, respects Fallen and Fallen was winning and beating him before Device really took over. And so he pays homage to Fallen, says he learned from his demos and all that. Right, here's the saddest thing about that. The eye test says there's nothing alike about their playing style. Fallen's the combat orping style, super close range, mega risky, willing to die and just trade or do nothing. Device is the super safe, traditional orper, use a teammate, have a flashbang, rotate off a site, save the gun appropriately, go to an AK when necessary, play from long range, use like things you scouted about the opponent against them. Like They're nothing alike. I don't care that he said it. People can say all sorts of shit. Someone can, you can watch them get beaten by someone and they go, no, it was just a misunderstanding, like he didn't mean it and plus I didn't, I'm not really that interested in it. You saw it. You saw it happen. People can just say whatever they like. You guys just repeat whatever people say. The Blast Paris Major, of course, made the tragic sin of daring to have exit interviews and that's just poor journalism, never from someone who knows what journalism is or how it operates and borderline cringe. So most interviews are variants on, does it feel good to win? Does it feel bad to lose? That's because of morons like you complaining like this. So they just ask vague, open-ended questions. If you go down, people are going, yeah, they should just ask uh, open-ended questions and uh, all this cringe and all that. Right, here's what's mad. That's because the person hasn't had time to process what they're thinking. You can't ask them this. You start to amass a comeback on map one, but ultimately drop the map. What do you think changed at the end there? The country be that. I've just lost the whole fucking tournament. One, I don't give a monkeys. Two, I can't think back. I've just finished the game. I'm overwhelmed with emotion. That's why people say, how are you feeling? By the way, the reason a lot of female interviewers say it's because that's what women like to do in a conversation is get a sense of what someone else's feelings are and where their heads are and what they might need and what nurturing aspects you need to give them. And therefore, no, what would be too much to ask? What 
be inappropriate, what be tactful. Women have a different social sense than men, and men actually can be very blunt and quite lacking in tact. Also, have you never seen the interviews, really good ones, after people lose like a massive sports game, especially a UFC where you get knocked the fuck out? You're giving them a chance to be on camera, do you still get their sponsor out there to win over fans, to, to make their fans understand, I'd really tried this, really cared on this one, it mattered to me, you know. Also, maybe you have some explanation, well, you know, I want to just give props to the other opponent. There's so many reasons to do them. And everyone's just complaining. Yeah, Dinko shouldn't have been hired to do it. Should have been Heku. I'm with you on that. Or it should even have been you old Frankie. But it wasn't. So unfortunately, this is what we got. The idea of the interviews themselves are bad. You, you don't know interviewing. Who the fuck are you? You know nothing about interviewing, you cretin. I'm the greatest interviewer in the history of these sports. And I'm telling you, it's fine to do them. And actually, simple open-ended questions are also fine. We'll do this as the last one. Nico, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Now, this is just a good comment. He says, Boston would have changed everything in terms of this conversation. A history-defining moment. Suddenly, you'd only really have players like KD and Arleigh as the greatest to never do it. Right, first of all, we'll just address the Boston part. I'm with you, because the problem is that team was almost everyone due for a major. Rain was due for one as a second or third star. Nico was a main star and the greatest rifler ever. He would have been dubbed after that. Uh, Carrigan, to put him in the GOAT conversation of IGL, even though he's already in it anyway, but for people who need the resume, etc. Guardian, because he just, I mean, he even is one of the greatest players ever, with or without a major. He's that great, and he deserved one for the last couple before that. He even had the injury out of nowhere. And then you obviously have... Olaf Meister already had majors, but he did it at a Dupree and won it in a different role and contributed in a different way with a different team and a national team. So yeah, it would have been really cool. The one part I will take umbrage with is this part. Then you'd only really have players like Cadian. Cadian's not one of the greatest players to never win a major. In fact, even if you do like greatest IGLs not to win a major, he'd be on the top 10, probably crack top five. Even people like Existence are ahead of him. If you don't get it, you don't get it. I'm willing for you. Just go, what the fuck? I'm not even going to explain it. Explain it a million times in my content. Cadian is mad overrated. He's a good IGL, a very good IGL at times now. As an individual player, he should never win a major, ever. It's outrageous he was even in a final. He's not a good enough opera, he's not a good enough raw player, and he calls set pieces and players for himself. And he takes the most expensive gun in the game, and as people say, that gun for him. This is outrageous. He is such an under... He's the new fallen. He's just overrated. Except as an IGL. Where I come from in England, people will often say, oh yeah, you and whose army? Well, I'll tell you what, I've got my own army backing me up. They're called the Skrilluminati. Thank you to Ahmed Haju, Joseph Adcock, Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Theogeny, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gore, Tosh, Tukan, and as always, you know it, a special thanks goes out to my boy, Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Do you want teasers? Find out who's in the upcoming interviews. Do you want to ask me a question in my monthly AMA? Maybe you want to be part of those long discussions where we talk about anything and everything in esports. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and enlist today in the Skrilluminati via the Patreon link in the box below.